Okay, okay, cool. Then, okay. Great. This is being inter uh, live stream now. Okay. Great. <clears throat> Okay, so we are live now. You're welcome to the Open Life Project. It is an honor for me to have uh, Judy Matthews and um, our research mentor, Dr. Asade Bosogi, is going to do the introduction uh, for Judy. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome and thank you very much for being here with us tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mrs. Judy Matthews. Uh, let me start by uh, telling you about Judy's education. Uh, she got her bachelor in music therapy and minor in psychology from University of Miami and her master of science in visual disabilities from Florida State University. Judy is a certified vision rehabilitation therapist. Um, she also has a background in music therapy. She has been in the field of vision rehabilitation for 17 years, and she has supervised adult rehabilitation staff uh, for six of those years. All that uh, at Lighthouse Central Florida. She's currently an assistive technology specialist with the, uh, with the Colorado Division of uh, Vocational Rehabilitations Blind and Low Vision Services Unit. For the last 15 years, Judy has been a member of the Consumer Advisory Group at the Capta Corp which is a company dedicated to making media accessible for everybody, uh, providing quality video description and closed captioning. Judy also has served on the guide dogs for the blind alumni board for over six years. And she has started a GDB Florida alumni chapter in 2007. Additionally, Judy has served on the Central Florida uh, Linux, did I say it correctly? Linux Transit Advisory Committee for five years. And she has recently begun uh, serving on the Colorado Springs Transit Passenger Advisory Committee. Judy has been instrumental in transportation advocacy efforts in Central Florida regarding fixed route, paratransit, and ride share services. Um, it's wonderful to have you tonight, Judy, and the floor is yours, please. So thank you so much. Tell us, about, I, you, tell us about yourself and we ask you questions at the end. <laughs> okay, yeah, and I just want to um make sure that I'm saying your name properly because I never say it right. Is it Asada? Asada, yes. Asada. Okay, Asada, thank you for that great introduction. Um, I appreciate it and I appreciate um, Omero inviting me to speak to you all today. Um, it's been really exciting to hear about what has been going on with the Open Light Project. Um, and I'm always excited about anything that promotes um, inclusion for everybody and also um, just uh, spreads more information um, because that's that's always uh, helpful and so um, I'm really um, happy to be um, involved and um, able to to contribute a small part here to uh, to, to the open light project and um, so I just uh, want to say that um, I, would welcome any questions as we go along. Um, I'm, I know that if I were sitting 
in an audience and I was, and I had a question um, and I had to wait till the end to ask it. I might forget what that question was. Okay. So, so I'm happy, like, you know, as we're going along, um, if there's any questions, um, I'll try to pause and, and ask if there are any questions um, along the way, but, but um, please feel free to jump in and ask anything. Um, yeah. So I was born in Havana, Cuba. Um, I was born with um, a visual impairment. Um, the eye condition is called Leber's congenital amaurosis. Um, it's a mouthful, just like any of the other eye conditions out there. Um, so what that means in layman's terms is that um, I can see light and dark. So I know that the lights are on in this room, uh, but I cannot see shapes or colors. And um, I've never been able to see any differently than I do now. Um, I wasn't aware that I had a visual impairment. I didn't even know, you know, as a kid, you don't really understand, um, especially if it's something that, you know, is not part of your life. Um, I didn't know that people could use their eyes to see. Um, so whenever I would lose my shoes, for example, and I would have to call my older brother or my parents to come help me find them. I thought it was because I was little and I would learn to um, do those kinds of things as I grew up. So I never understood, like as a kid, I didn't understand, um, as a young child, I didn't understand that. Um, the reason I couldn't find my shoes was because my eyes didn't work and I, I wasn't able to see them. Um, I, um, when I was about six years old, um, I had that discussion with my mom because I asked her one day, um, I had heard some kids whispering at the park and I had heard kids, um, you know, whisper about um, me before, but I didn't really understand why they were, what they were talking about. And even when kids would ask me if I was blind, I really didn't understand what that meant. So if someone asked me, are you blind? I'd say, sure, I guess, I don't know. Um, I had no clue. So, um, but one day I asked my, my mom, you know, what is it that um, these kids are whispering about? You know, why, why, why are they whispering? And so she, um, I still remember to this day, even though I don't remember um, exactly the words she said, I've never forgotten um, just the sentiment behind them. You know, she said, your eyes, something like your eyes don't work um, normally um, like they should. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't do anything that you put your mind to. Um, and so those, that, that was kind of the, the meaning behind what she said to this six-year-old. And I had no clue, you know, I, at that point I was just like, okay, great, thanks. And, you know, life went on. And I, I really didn't fully understand at that point. But what I did understand was that, um, you know, my parents believed in me um, and that it wasn't, you know, that I, I was okay and that I could do anything that I wanted to. Um, so, um, you know, the title of my presentation today was, um, is turning obstacles into opportunities. And so um, I want to back up a little bit um, because um, I think one of the first examples of that is us coming to the United States. I was probably almost two years old when we came and um, my parents um, later told me that you know, uh, one of the big reasons that they decided to come to this country was because they understood um, that I would have a lot more opportunities here. Um, and so even though leaving your country behind and starting over in a brand new place where, um, you know, they didn't speak the language, they didn't understand the customs, um, you know, it was a huge barrier, but, um, you know, they, decided to, uh, to take the chance. And obviously it was also because, you know, the situation in Cuba was what it was. Um, and even back then things were uh, not so great. And so um, of course it was also an opportunity to just start over um, in a place that afforded everyone more opportunities. Um, but it was a barrier to begin with, but um, you know, it afforded us, all of us, um, you know, more opportunities than, than anybody understood back then. So, um, so when, um, when I was, I think I was seven or eight years old, um, 
fast forward a few years, um, my parents decided to buy me a piano. I was taking piano lessons and uh, they wanted to me to have a, a piano so that I could practice. And um, my, uh, they found a way to get rid of me. Uh, so, you know, they, they had me go to a friend's house the day that the piano was being delivered. And when I came back that day, um, I noticed the furniture was all moved around. And so I was like, mom, why is the couch over here? Why are things different? And she was just like, oh, well, you know, it's Christmas. We just want to move things around and, you know, no big deal. And so they moved the furniture around so that I wouldn't be able to get to the piano. So for like two days, the piano was sitting there and I had no idea that it was there. Um, so, um, you know, that that was um, just a, a funny example of how, you know, they <laughs> were able to, uh, you know, my visual impairment um, was actually to, to everyone's advantage because they were able to surprise me, um, you know, the, the day of, uh, you know, Christmas Eve. Um, and otherwise, I don't know how they would have pulled that off. But um, so that was just kind of a fun thing. Um, you know, a um, couple years later, I um, started, I heard of a, of a talent competition. It was called the Rising Star. And the reason I'm mentioning it here is because um, it is, it was um, a competition for um, uh, kids and teenagers um, who had disabilities. And so um, if I hadn't had my visual impairment, I wouldn't have um, ever, I, I wouldn't have heard of it. I wouldn't have participated in it. And it was just such a great, um, it opened a lot of, of doors for me. It, it um, allowed me to get more involved with music um, through the Rising Star competition. I met my voice teacher um, who played a, a really important role in my life, um, you know, for years to come. Uh, I used to be a, a pretty shy person and I feel like music really helped me um, to come out of my shell and um, to feel more comfortable in my own skin and expressing myself. And so I, um, I'm, I'm grateful for that opportunity because that started everything. Um, and that was, um, a, you know, a great opportunity. Um, so speaking of barriers um, to opportunities. Um, so for some of us, um, you know, math didn't come, uh, wasn't something that, um, you know, came naturally or um, that we were great at. Um, and, and that was the case for me. I, I wasn't horrible at math, but I wasn't, um, it wasn't something that I, I felt like I was, I, um, you know, was great at or super comfortable with. Um, and so when I um, heard that um, I was going to be taking geometry and this was, uh, I was in ninth grade. And, um, you know, that to me, that was a, it was a huge obstacle, like, oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm probably going to fail this class. Um, but the class ended up being one of my favorite classes and one that I, I actually um, did really well at. And that was because um, my instructor, uh, Ms. Nussbaum, she was, um, she decided um, that she wanted to learn Braille so that she could help me, she could better help me in her class. And so she um, took the time to, to learn Braille. Um, she would create diagrams for me out of string, out of wax. Um, she would label them for me. Um, she would make sure that I was understanding things. And so even though like to me, you know, math um, up to then had, had been kind of a big barrier, um, you know, it, it, it actually um, became an opportunity, um, you know, for me to learn a lot, but also for my instructor to learn a lot about including um, kids with disabilities in, in her classroom and being creative about teaching. Um, and it was so cool. I, um, I, I still to this day, you know, one of the great things about Facebook is that you can keep in touch with people that you probably wouldn't keep in touch with um, <laughs> ever. And um, she is on my Facebook page and I'm, I'm happy to still be in touch with her and be able to once in a while, every once in a while, I still thank her for helping me um, understand geometry uh, better. So. Um, lots of, of examples um, throughout my life about how something that was an obstacle um, became an opportunity. Um, 
you know, I'll just, um, just say a couple more. Um, when I was in high school, uh, I remember this one day, um, my, one of my teachers um, had asked me to go down to the school store and get, I don't even remember what it was that I was going to buy, um, but it was lunchtime. It was um, super crowded. And, you know, I was, I was still, I was, I was still kind of shy. Um, and I, was not excited about going down there at lunch in the big crowd of people and, you know, possibly getting lost down there and everything. Um, so to me, that was like, uh, I was not, not thinking nice things about my teacher at that time, but for her, it was a lesson for me. Um, you know, she was doing it because, um, even though she knew that it was a challenge and, a, and an obstacle, um, she knew that I would learn from it. So I went down there. I, you know, didn't get too lost. I got what I needed to get and, and came back. And, and the reason I mentioned this is because I, I feel like that was kind of um, a lesson about, you know, things aren't always going to be easy uh, in life. And so you're just going to sometimes have to, you know, push through and do what you need to do, um, but you will get it done. And, you know, throughout my life, um, I have, um, you know, my, my motto has, has been for a long time, um, you know, I'll figure it out. So even when something is hard or um, I'm not sure how something's going to get done or um, there are these these challenges, I'm not sure how how they're going to, you know, how it's going to, um, how everything is going to work out. But I know it will and, and, and I'll figure it out. And so um, that is, I feel like that day, um, you know, it, it was a lesson learned, um, even though it was a, a hard one. Um, when I started, fast forward to uh, when I started my um, studies, my music therapy studies. Um, music school is is tough. Um, so much, you know. I, I wonder if people think that music school is super easy because it's music and you're just, you know, <laughs> you're just gonna go and you know sing or perform and play around and whatever. Um, we had so many classes. I think I had like ten or eleven classes a semester on a regular basis. Some of the classes we had to take weren't. Um, didn't have any credits. They were zero credit classes, um, but we still had to go because they were part of our program. Um, I was on scholarship, so I had to go to, I had to attend um, recitals and I had to, um, a certain number of recitals a semester. I had to join a couple of choirs and um, to keep my scholarship and such. So it, it was um, a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed myself, but it was also a lot of work. Um, and um, I say that, um, just because, um, you know, thinking of it, if you, a lot of times, if you think of the obstacles, um, you know, all at once, it's super overwhelming. If I had thought about everything I was going to have to do, I might've been scared away from doing it. I would have been like, I don't know that I want to do that. I don't know that I can do this. Um, but, you know, just taking it one day at a time, um, was the way I got through it. And of course, music and, um, you know, I had, I had great um, instructors. I learned so much. Um, and one of those instructors uh, was my theory professor. Um, and speaking of obstacles, um, you know, not being able to see, um, you know, presented obstacles and for example, doing um, music theory, being able to read music um, and, and, um, doing a placement test to see where I would, what classes I needed to, uh, what level of music theory I was going to start at and things like that. And I remember just being really nervous about it. And my prof the professor came over and said, you know, don't worry about it. I'm going to help you out. We're, we'll meet together and uh, we'll do it. And we, we will, um, you know, I'll make sure that um, I'll make sure that you, you can take the, the test and I'll, uh, I'll read it to you and, and we'll get this done. And uh, you know, the next two years, like four semesters, I had this professor. Um, he taught me music theory one on one. And so something that was, you know, initially an obstacle, like me not being able to see the music, I didn't know Braille music at the time. Um, and so, um, you know, just not not being able to to actually like, you know, take a piece of music and sight read it and learn about, um, you know, how these things worked. Um, turned out to be a huge opportunity because I got so much one-on-one -on -one time with this awesome instructor that taught me so much, um, you know, and so 
I um, appreciated um, and, and um, you know, looking back, I can see that, you know, that definitely was an obstacle that got turned into a, a wonderful opportunity. And a couple of, of, of other ones, um, I probably wouldn't know my husband if it wasn't for um, having to go, um, having to uh, participate or wanting to participate in vision rehabilitation training in Daytona. Um, I went there for, um, for a summer uh, to do do some training and and uh, he happened to be there and so um, that is how we met. Uh, he likes to say we met in rehab um, <laughs> but um, anyway so we um, so so I, I always whenever um, talking about um, positives of um, my visual impairment that is a huge one for me like obviously I you know I may not have ever um, met my husband if it wasn't for that. Um, so, you know, my guide dog, um, I have a guide dog, um, and I've had two, he's my second one. I is a yellow lab. And, um, if it wasn't for my, my blindness, I wouldn't have him. I wouldn't have had the awesome opportunity to work with both of those wonderful, amazing guide dogs that have added so much to my life. Um, and so those are some of the ways that in my life, um, barriers have become opportunities. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, it takes uh, looking back to see that, but, um, you know, and um, so in, in so many ways, um, a lot of the advances that, that we've had, um, you know, like for example, um, disability rights, um, you know, section 504, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, the WCAG, um, Web Content Accessibility, can't remember what the G is. Um, so all of these things have, didn't happen because, oh, it's just, you know, we're just going to do this um, just for fun or just because uh, this would be a great idea. Um, these things happened because um, there was a need, right? So if it wasn't that disability, that people with disabilities didn't have rights, um, you know, and didn't fight for those rights and didn't, um, then the Americans with Disabilities Act wouldn't be a reality today. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, there's a quote that comes to mind and it's, um, necessity is a mother of invention. Um, I was looking it up and um, found that um, originally um, it was by Plato. And what he said was, our need will be the real creator. And then it became necessity is the mother of invention. Um, but if there's a need, um, oftentimes, you know, awesome things happen um, when there is a need, um, you know, um, and it doesn't always have, you know, a, the greatest um, start, um, like, you know, Louis Braille, um, he lost his sight at the age of three when he was um, playing around with sharp instruments in his father's harness shop. Um, and uh, so if, you know, of course, at the time, um, that was a tragedy. It was awful. Um, but fast forward, and he's responsible for us having the Braille system. And, um, you know, if that hadn't happened, um, we, wouldn't, we, we may not have Braille. We wouldn't have Braille as it is today. We may have something else, but not that. Uh, and so, you know, it um, these things um, have, you know, have have happened um, and have turned out, um, you know, positive things have come of these not so not so great things. Um, so, any any questions so far? I know if. Um, I said I was going to stop and ask for questions, and then I haven't. But um, does does anyone have any any questions um, at this point? I do. Yeah, sure. Uh, 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 my name is Mariam. It's uh, as I did, you just called me like a few minutes before, and I'm glad I jump on this opportunity. I tell you later on at the end a little bit about my background that would encounter with the people visually challenged, but there was a 40 years uh, time in between now. This is my first time again. Did you learn the geometry in a regular class? Yeah, I mean, the rest of the student uh, in a geometry class was a regular student and you just have to- Correct. 
Wow. Yes, it was a regular class. It was a, a main, um, I was mainstreamed. So I was, I went to a, um, to a high school that had a vision program and I would, I had one class with that vision professor, but then the rest of the classes were, um, with um, regular students that that didn't have any any impairments, um, and so yeah, that geometry class was one of those. That is incredible. I'm sure that that teacher really was having a big uh, you know effect on your life. The other thing is at the beginning of your speech, you said uh, you can see light and dark, and that's what you know. Like there's a light in, but if there is an obstacle like a sofa or chair, doesn't show to you as a darker part. Or no? Um, yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, so it, it, it probably, it does block some light, but um, yeah, I can't see like the shape of it or anything like that. Um, it's more like a shadow. And how do you uh, commute from home to work to the places that you have to be? You know, um, I, at the moment I live 0.6 miles from the office, so if I actually have to go into the office, I can just walk there. Um, but I also um, take Uber or Lyft um, or with coworkers um, for work. Um, and of course, um, just getting around, I you know might take the, the bus or paratransit. So lots of different ways. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks for your question. Um, I was wondering if I, um, if, if I would, if I am able to, um, share my screen, if I wanted to show, um, a quick video, would that be possible? It would be Brent, possible, I guess. Oh. We don't need to, yes, I'm going to make, her, okay. make her co-host, right? That, that would be awesome. If that's okay. That's yes, okay. Me. Sure. Okay, it's only like three minutes, um, and it's it's a video um, about um, Henter Joyce. Um, Henter Joyce um, was the guy that um, came up with um, one of the most popular screen readers out there, um, which is called JAWS, Job Access with Speech, um, and. Um, he, you know, this, this is a great example of, you know, turning an obstacle into an opportunity. Um, but, um, this is like what they were celebrating, like the 20 years of, um, of, uh, Jaws, um, you know, of the creation of Jaws, I guess. And, uh, so the video is long, but we're just going to watch like the first three minutes because it was, um, a little excerpt about, um, him and his life and how he, um, started that and um you know what it meant so so the sharing screen is enabled now oh cool share. okay let me let me just i'm gonna open the video first and then um and then share it all right we're gonna skip these ads hold on <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's try. Oh, here we go. Okay. All right, and thank you, Matt. Battery the flatter one cop lot and you sit up that high. Hey, have you shared it? Because we can't see it, Judy. One second. It keeps moving. I don't know why. Okay, here we go. Uh... There. Oh, okay. Windows 20th anniversary. You're probably hearing my screen reader at the moment. PC. Are you hearing something? Windows 20th anniversary video YouTube. Yes, we can. Okay, hear. so that, <laughs> so that's my screen reader. It's not going to talk. I'm just going to go ahead and start the uh, the video um, for these next three minutes. Okay. Hi, and welcome to the Jaws for Windows 20th anniversary video. My name is Eric Cameron. I'm the Vice President of Software Product Management at Freedom Scientific. We'd like to thank all of the people who submitted videos and testimonials to us and wished us well for the 20th anniversary. We've included many of them here in this video for you. But we begin the video 
with a recording that was done in 1998 back at Henter Joyce at our home headquarters when 60 Minutes visited with us and did a story on Ted Henter and Jaws for Windows. Thank you and enjoy our video. Ted Henter is another blind inventor who's demolishing stereotypes. Water skiing is just his hobby, though he was world champion a few years back. His breakthrough invention is something called JAWS. JAWS is software that makes the computer talk. Ted was blinded 20 years ago in an auto accident. What did you do before? Before I was blinded? Yes. I was a motorcycle racer. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, Ted Henter needed to find something else to do. I was a sighted kid. I grew up with dreams. But once I was blinded, I, none of those were relevant anymore. They, they weren't going to work for me, so I had to think up new dreams. The good that came out of it was that Ted began studying computers, and before long, he developed software that read computer text and turned it into speech. I have several other questions. With JAWS reading the computer screen, suddenly blind people with a 70% unemployment rate could compete for all kinds of jobs that used to be unthinkable. FedEx, Heather Stubbs speaking. May I help you? If you call FedEx, you might get a blind customer service agent. FedEx has about a dozen blind employees working the phones using JAWS. You don't have to be limited by your blindness. You can go out and do these things. You can go to college. You can get a PhD. You can get a job as a computer programmer, as a software designer, as an attorney. Ted figured out a way to make Windows work for blind people. Now he's making the Internet accessible. But every day, he and his team of programmers have to overcome new obstacles the sighted computer world throws their way. How often do you have to change your software because there's a new problem out there? We, we change it weekly. Weekly? Um, almost daily, depending on the week. So we're constantly working on it. The we includes 20 other blind employees. Open the start menu. So if you're a blind customer using JAWS and you have a question, you're likely to get a blind technical support guy to answer. They just want to really stay on fixing problems. If you were to choose a word to describe what this does to help a blind person or what your goal is, what would it be? I think equality is a good word. Full speech. Running applications list box. Jaws for Windows. Lens escape. Yeah. Oh, controls. Media All right. So... I figured it was easier for me to, it was better for me to share that than to try to explain. Um, better to hear it in, in his own words, but, um, you know, what a, what a great example of turning an obstacle into an opportunity. And, um, you know, it opened up so many doors for so many people, um, allowed people to, like you said, you know, compete for so many jobs that were at, you know, to that point had been out, you know, off limits. Um, so, so many other examples, there's another guy, um, and Asada, I thought about you because um, I thought you might be interested in um, um, this guy's story. Um, so his his name is Mike May. He's a um, he developed um, one of the first, if not the first, um, GPS for um, blind and visually impaired users. Um, his company was Sendero uh, GPS, and he lost his sight um, also around the age of. I believe, um, due to a chemical explosion. Um, but what was cool was he had um, an opportunity um, to regain sight um, using um, stem cells, and he actually went for it. Um, but it, um, it was a really interesting um, adventure, I guess, um, because yes, he regained some sight, um, but his, he had to pretty much teach his brain um, to see. Um, it, he had to teach it wasn't like an automatic thing. Um, and so anyway, it's a, it's a really interesting story. His book is called Crashing Through. Um, and what I'll do is I will put a link to his, um, I'll put a link to um, his site and um, to um, his story in the chat. Thank you, that would be great. Yeah, let me, I, I want to find it because it's, 
I had a couple of different ones. So I want to make sure I give you the right. Notice that the screen, the screen reader that you're using is like very fast. Do you understand? Yes. <laughs> um, so I, okay, let's see. So I just put that in the, let's make sure that was the right one. Um, and so it's not, you're not hearing my screen reader at the time, right? You're not able to hear my computer now, right? No, no, we don't. Okay, but good, good, good. It's interesting. How fast can you understand speaking like language? Because um, oh, cool. Thanks, Case. Um, I, so <laughs> I've gotten used to uh, listening to speech that fast. Um, you know, when, when somebody starts um, using a computer with speech, um, you know, they may not start that fast and then they just um, may develop their um, ability to understand um, synthetic speech. Um, and then of course, um, it, you know, you, your brain just kind of gets used to it. Um, I have a, a student, um, I, I like to brag about him because when I first, when he first started with me and this was at my last job, um, his um, compute, you know, he had it um, pretty slow, the normal pace, And then um, the more he used it, the, the faster he started using it. And then he, he actually has it way faster than, than I do. Um, and he says, oh, well, I have to make sure people don't understand what I'm listening to. I don't want people understanding what I'm doing. And so he purposely wanted to like push himself to, you know, hear it super, super duper fast. And I'm like, okay, I can't even understand that. Slow it down for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, it's amazing what, how the brain can adapt. Um, so Yeah, um, but I just um, I, I just want to encourage you guys um, that you know it, it, it's I think that one of the first things you know you guys already have the interest um, and the desire to to help and to make the world a better and more inclusive place and that's such a great um, you know place to 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 come from um, and I think that um, you know it. Lots of, I think a lot of things, you know, we'll look back five years, 10 years, we'll go, oh, so I remember when these things were getting started, you know, Olmedo, I know you, you have lots of um, goals and, um, you know, um, things that you, you know, you are um, trying to make happen um, to make, make life easier for, for blind and visually impaired um, people. Like, um, can you talk about some of them? Maybe we can, um, discuss a little bit about um, kind of how, how these things are coming along and what, what some of the possibilities are. Is that okay? Yes, of course. I'm trying to, uh, one of the things that I would like to, to do is to, in, to put Braille on the canned food and different products. So it's like more common to see uh, that the products are um, labeled with uh, the title, like the product that people is going to buy. And also the expiration date. So I want to make that like um like something completely common in our society, and to establish um like a standard. That's you awesome. That could be something like this could be useful. Absolutely. So you know now, like if and. You know, if, if, if we want to know what an expiration date is on something, we have to, um, of course, thanks to technology, we have ways to get that information a lot more than, than we used to. So before, so, you know, looking back 10, 15, 20 years, if I went grocery shopping, um, I would, and I still do this because I feel like um, it's more efficient, but... I would just write down the expiration dates of the things that were perishable. And I would just have, you know, make a note in my, um, I have a braille computer that I usually carry around. And um, so I'd have my grocery list there and I would make a list, a note of those expiration dates. And I would have to get that from the people who were helping me get the groceries. Um, and now um, if, if I'm using Instacart, for example, um, to get my groceries, Um, which I, we, we do quite a bit. Um, so I, I still like going to the grocery store. I'm kind of old fashioned like that. I like to go and pick my own fruits and vegetables and everything, but 
I, I, I admit that the convenience of Instacart is awesome. So we, we use Instacart quite a bit. And so um, when people bring groceries, um, I have no idea what the expiration date is for things. Um, I may ask them um, if it's like for milk or something. Um, I may chat with the person shopping and say, hey, what's the expiration date for that? But um, once we, when we get the products, so my husband and I, neither one of us has any vision. And so uh, we can't look at a gallon of milk and say, oh yeah, the expiration date is December 25th. So, um, but now we, we have other technology um, other ways that technology has given us to, um, to get that information. For example, an app like um, Ira or Be My Eyes, um, which both of those apps will connect you with a sighted person um, using an app who um, can look through your camera and tell you what they're seeing. And so, but, um, you know, you have to find the date. So you know that every, every, product has the date in a different place. Some products are super difficult to find the date, even when you're looking at it. Um, cheese comes to mind. I don't know why it is, but cheese seems to be um, pretty hard to, <laughs> to find the date. Um, but, you know, so, you know, we have to take the camera and we have to, you know, move it around the product and, you know, get them to tell it, okay, do you see the date here? No. Nope. Okay. Let me turn it around next side. You know, so it's not a quick, like, here, let me look at the date. You know, it's um, not complaining because it's great that it exists and somebody can give us that information now. Um, but how awesome it would be for us to be able to pick up a box or a can or a, a you know, a container or something and be able to, um, those of us who read Braille, um, be able to, to feel what that is, you know, what's the name of it. Um, we don't have to use um, some other technology to, to tell us what it is. Um, and then also, the expiration date, whether that's um, using Braille or um, maybe using um, like a um, some other um, type of um, technology that you can scan and like it would tell you the date. Um, but Omero and I were talking about this the other day. Um, you know how awesome it would be if all of the expiration dates were always in the same place. I I always joke around with people that when I become president all the bathrooms are going to be standard. So the paper towels are going to be on one side. The soap is always going to be in the same place, you know, and because, I mean, just imagine going into a restroom and having to figure out, okay, you know, I'm here at the sink. So um, is this one of these faucets that you just hold your hand underneath and it starts, you know, the water starts or do you have to turn it on and then, okay, where's the soap? And then now is the paper towel dispenser here? Is it across the, you know, behind me on the wall or so, you know, it's always fun um, to have to try to figure that out. Um, and so uh, it would be awesome if it was always standard. Um, and so like, just like, um, you know, the ADA has standards, for example, um, and I don't know what those, I'm not an expert on the ADA. So I don't know how, how, um, for example, the, the push buttons on the doors, they have to be at a certain height, um, different um, things um, in a building have to be um, at certain heights, um, there needs to be a certain um, measurement for for doorways and, and things um, so that they're accessible. And so there are standards um, that need to be met. And, uh, you know, we're heading more and more in that direction. So why not? Why couldn't there be standards for, you know, food products like the date is always here, um, you know, and it's always in a nice, bold print so that if you're using an app, because that's the other thing, sometimes the date blends in with the, um, you know, the, the other text or, you know, it's, it's not, vis not super visible. Um, maybe the, the text isn't um, very clear um, or it's, um, I, all I know is that the apps don't always pick it up. Sometimes it's really hard to use an app that uses artificial intelligence or that uses OCR, optical character recognition. It's hard to use those things to find dates. So that's why nine times out of 10, I just get frustrated and I end up using one of those apps that connects me with a human that can look at the product and tell me. Um, if I don't have a sighted person to tell me in person, then I just use a sighted person on an app because using apps that are automated, sometimes it's just more trouble than it's worth. So it'd be awesome if um, these expiration dates and these this product information could be more, um, you know, 
easily um, accessed um, across the board, whether that's with Braille or with a code or with a uh, QR code or with a barcode or with all of the, you know, all of the ways <laughs> that we can think of um, to, to make it accessible. Um, and if somebody, for example, uses an, uh, a smartphone or a smart device to access the information, um, they can also use a Braille display um, to, to read it on their phone if they wanted to read it in Braille, or they could listen to it, or they could use magnification. So if somebody has low vision, um, they can have their phone enlarged, and so they can see the screen. So maybe um, they're not able to see the teeny tiny um, expiration date on there, but um, if they're looking at it, if they scan it with their phone, it'll pop up on their phone, and then they can see it, um, and they can enlarge it on their phone, or they can listen to it, or they can read it with their fingers using a um, refreshable Braille display. For anyone that doesn't know what a refreshable Braille display is, um, I'm actually going to grab one so that I can show it because I think that'd be easier to, um, to explain or I'll explain it and then show one. Um, so it's, um, a, so, so the, the refreshable Braille display has pins um, that are in a uh, one line of Braille. They're in that formation. Um, and Braille is made up of um, Braille cells, which are six dots. Um, and the six dots are in the formation of, if you think of like um, uh, dice that you play with, you know, like the number six on a dice. So three on one side, three on the other. So that's a, a Braille cell has that um, formation. And so you have a bunch of little Braille cells in a row. Um, you know, you have the, the uh, Braille displays that are um, 18 cells, um, 32, 40, even 80. <laughs> um, but um, they're just one line and the, the little pins will pop up and show you in Braille what is being displayed on either the screen of your computer, on the screen of your smartphone, or on the Braille display itself. Some of them have like memory and you can, um, you know, store things in there. Um, so I'm just going to grab one so I can show it. Um, okay. Huh. You know what? I thought there was one there. Give me one second. I'm just going to. Okay, here we go. So now let's just hope it, the battery's not dead or something because, you know, Murphy's Law. Um, sometimes it locks up. <laughs> okay. So, all right, y'all are going to have to help me out here. Can you see this on your screen? Am I holding it? Yeah. Yes. So that yes. you can see it? Okay. Yes. So are you able, all right, hold on a minute. Hey, what happened to it? There we go. Okay. Are you able to see the pins moving up and down? Or is it too, too far away? Or Yes, I see some movement. Yeah. Okay. So right now I'm just scrolling the, the, the screen, or I call it my one line screen. So there are 18 of the Braille cells here. And I'm just scrolling, scrolling the information and then the pins move up and down to show what it is. So I'm gonna show you just like a line of just Braille cells. Um, and all right, come on, go back. Okay, so here, can you see it? So this is all, now they're all up the whole line of cells. And all of the dots are there. And then if I were to scroll, now you just have a few and they're moving up and down. So, um, so this is a device that um, can connect via Bluetooth, can connect um, via USB. Um, you know, there are different ways that it can connect to your computer or your phone. Um, and so it also allows you to type on your phone or on your computer directly from this device. You saw that it also had keys on it. So you, in Braille, you use just six keys um, to type anything. So it's combinations of those keys. 
Um, so yeah, so you know there there are lots of ways. So Braille on paper or Braille on the so I guess the challenge that I see with expiration dates in Braille is that it would have to be they would have to continuously change the uh, the Braille because the expiration dates are, are going to change. Whereas like the product name is something that might be easier because it's just the product name. It's not going to change and they can just, I don't know. I, I don't know how that, how those things would be done. Um, but, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there's, there's a way um, and, you know, technology is advancing and maybe, um, you know, maybe it would be no big deal, you know, five or 10 years down the road. To, oh yeah. We'll just put the expiration in Braille and change it, you know, whenever it's needed. Um, but I know like right now, um, if I were to go, for example, to a restaurant, um, if they have a Braille menu, it might or might not be up to date. So it might be that this Braille menu was, you know, five, 10 years old and they still have it and it hasn't been updated in that long. So yes, they have it, um, but it's keeping those things up to date that sometimes um, can be the challenge. So I hope that that makes sense. So on the on the expiration day, we had an idea of maybe like a reveal, like on the paper tags, like on cans and things of that nature, like a reveal, like the dotted reveal on the actual tap on the actual paper print when they print those out and they label them on the cans. Mm -hmm. So that was an idea, and that could always be changing when they when they run it through the machine and to actual label it onto the can or whatever the product was when we put the, when they put the label up to have a machine updating that expiration date. So are you saying like, when you say reveal, do you mean like that it would be like, um, like you could, you could feel the print or are you saying that it would be in braille or it would be in print, but like raised print or something? Yeah. It's like a raised print kind of just maybe the, there might be some cost in the, making the paper, maybe a little thicker, you know, I don't mm -hmm. know, maybe paper now is maybe, I don't know, one one hundredth of a millimeter or one sixtieth of a mil millimeter. You might have to go to one fiftieth of a mil millimeter so that the rays, it'll withstand it when it prints on it. When it when it makes a um, an indentation, let's call it, on the paper to, for it to withstand and hold the Braille so that um, it can uh, hold the test of time, let's say. Yeah, yeah, um, that's cool. Um you know, I, I think that definitely, you know, got to try stuff. Um, and I love, is it Zamir? Did I, did I say that right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. Um, I think that, you know, you're, you know, thinking along the right lines and having, having ideas to try. Um, you know, I think that um, one thing to keep in mind, just in general, um, to all of you, as you come up with these ideas and I think that you're doing it now even um, is reaching out to people that can can give you feedback and then uh, like along the whole process like having people you know looking at it uh, making sure that you know it would be usable for them um, so for example um, when the U.S. Treasury um when it was ruled that money needed to be made accessible because the U.S. Treasury got sued, um, <laughs> they um, were uh, they started to this whole process about of um, evaluating like how are we going to make money tactual? How are we going to make it accessible? And we're still waiting because you know these things take time. But there was a lot of research done. Um, I remember going to many conferences and there would be that the Department of uh, uh, Bureau of Engraving and Printing would, would be there and they would have a table and they would have like, a, um, here, um, we'd like to, uh, to show you um, some of the different um, uh, tactile um, ways that, that um, we would identify money to, just to see if they would work. And so like, um, you know, they may have like, you know, three or four or five different ways um, and, and they would, they would have a bunch of people who were, who were blind or visually impaired, um, looking at those, um, to see if, you know, if it would be usable, if they could, if they could feel the difference. So, um, you know, uh, that's how they, um, agreed on, okay, this is what we're going to use. And then they also found out that, you know, some people aren't going to be able to feel those things because maybe they have diabetes and they have neuropathy. So they're, 
um, not able to feel, um, you know, their, their um, sense of touch is impaired as well. And so um, even though money um, may have some tactile features, um, they may not be as tactile for, for someone who has neuropathy. So then they decided, okay, we're, we're also going to um, provide another way to make money accessible. And they started sending out these little money reader devices for free to people. Um, where you could insert the money, push a button, and it tells you it's a $5 bill or a $10 bill or what have you. So um, it was, um, you know, the need was there. And then they, they um, you know, saw that there was that need. And so I think with a lot of your projects, you're going to find that you'll have these great ideas and then you'll start. And then it may turn into something, um, you know, a little bit different than, than you initially thought. Um, but also exciting and also useful. Um, and you're going to be able to see, to determine, you know, gosh, what is, what's going to be the most useful for people. So like, you know, when you get this far, you know, go to the conferences, go to the, the ACB American council of the blind or the NFB national federation of the blind, go to their national conferences and, you know, ask to, to, uh, you know, do, um, some, you know, to, uh, you know, do some surveys or have people look at stuff or, you know, give, give you feedback on those things. Uh, I just want to say, coming. I just want to say I have another Zoom I have to participate in. I want to thank everybody and Judy. Sure, and thank you. You. Do you want to say that thing that you wanted to say at the end? Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, f first of all, I was want to say that when I was in college, like ages ago, uh, we had few uh, uh, vision impaired uh, students that I was helping reading to them. There was a brawl back then in, the, in uh, some of the book, but they were normally either in lit literature class or political science. And I have two or three of them that I was reading religiously few hours every day, for when, especially when they have exam. And then there, oh. was another, there was another guy who I helped him to get his diploma. Twice a week, he would take a bus, come to my house, and I was helping him in all the subject. And he got his um, diploma. And when we got married, he bought a present and take the bus and came to our house. Unfortunately, since I moved to America in the last 42 years, my totally I got totally disconnected with those friends. And this is the first time after 42 years. And I'm amazed how much, how, what a long way everything came, but I'm sure still my heart goes for the country that I'm sure such a, such a country like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, that I'm almost 100% sure still everything is the same. And there is uh, hopefully maybe technology doesn't have any borders and it gets to them too. But other than that, I don't think so many of the government do, do pay attention to mm. these challenges. Thank you very much, Judy. You took me back 40 some years and I got so emotional that I'm going to go look for those friends again. Oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, thanks, Maria. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. And uh, have a wonderful night. I have to participate in another Zoom at 8 o'clock, which I'm already a little bit late. Thank you. Good luck to all of you. And let me know in future if there is another program like that. Thank you. We will. Thanks, Maria. Bye-bye. But I think that it's completely possible to do the day because every day we have a discrete number of days. So we can pair up each configuration of Braille dots to one specific day. So instead of printing September 7, 2022, they print the dots instead. So it's, it's simple to do that. And in the standard, we can implement a high contrast. So they put mm -hmm. the date in a place where it's standard is standardized, they mm -hmm. have contrast. So uh, people with low vision can see better and right. can easily scan with the, with, the, with the app. And at the same time, they have the braille. So they have high contrast for visually uh, those uh, low vision people. It's going to be easier for the cameras to capture that. And it's also going to be in braille. And they can, when they do the industrial process, they can compare the printed day with the braille and verify that's correct. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, I love how, you know, 
making something accessible sometimes will be, it'll be, um, it will solve more than one problem. It'll help more than one group of people. Um, you know, when websites are made accessible um, to blind and visually impaired people, it also makes it easier for like the, um, the assistants like Siri uh, or Google to access the information um, as well. So, you know, it, it also um, just makes it um, sometimes easier to, to read, not just for um, blind and visually impaired um, customers, but just anyone. So like with your um, idea of making the dates, um, you know, in the same place and higher contrast and everything, it's it's not only going to, you know, yeah, it's going to be awesome for, for a blind and visually impaired person trying to um, to, to look up the, uh, the expiration date. Um, but also just, just easier for, for, for anyone, um, you know, to, because you're, you know, not going to have to go trying to find, you know, oh gosh, where is that hidden? And oh my goodness, it's so tiny. I can't read it. And it's blending in with every, you know, it's, it's just going to be so much easier, um, for people to access. Yeah, so we're going to develop more of these, this idea and try to, to make it happen. I'm sure that this is something important and they will listen to our proposal. And this is something that I want to see happen. That's great. Judy, and um, how important do you think um, that online education and technology is for visual impaired people in their experience? <laughs> I'm sorry, more, how important is online education and technology? Technology for visually impaired people. Huge, huge. Um, so <laughs> I know Casey's here and um, I, I would love for, for you to, to talk um, just for a minute, Case, about your experience with online learning before online learning was so popular because now I feel like it, it's you know, so many places and the pandemic just kind of propelled it forward, like so much, but even before, like it was just becoming more popular uh, for people to um, study online and, and uh, to go, you know, virtual classes and such. But um, in case when you got your degree, that was what, 13 years ago or something like that. Um, you know, it wasn't so popular and yet um, you did it. So what, t tell us a little bit about like why it was important for you or um, how yeah. your experience was. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I started um, in a typical, you know, community college campus. And um, this was, um, I started it in, in the late 90s, uh, 98, 99. And I just had, for me, it was a rough time because I had to get all of my materials um, in an accessible format. So this was, you know, before just as the internet was really, really starting to take off in a, in a big way. Um, and, uh, you know, so that a lot of that stuff that we take for granted today wasn't available. So for me at the time, I either had to get a reader to read my class materials, and this could be paper, you know, assignments, it could be textbook material, um, it could be, um, you know, maybe something that uh, was written on the board. Um, I may have to spend time getting um, textbooks in accessible format, either by scanning them into a computer or, um, you know, having somebody read them to me. So there's a lot of, um, just a lot of uh, legwork involved um, in just doing the work that I had to do. And then once all the information was accessible to me, then I had to go and figure out how I was going to do my assignment um, you know, so then the, the actual college work um, began after all that was done. And mm -hmm. for me, I felt like I was doing so much work um, just to do the college work. Uh, it just, for me, it wasn't worth it. And so in 2004, um, I decided to go back to school and get my information technology um, degree. And my requirement was, yeah, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it online. And it turned out to be a great decision. I ended up, <clears throat> I ended up going with the uh, University of Phoenix 
and everything was completely accessible for my screen reading technology. So that meant that I could um, essentially log in and participate in um, class discussions. I could uh, read my books. It was all electronic. So in other words, you would click on a week reading link, for example, and all of your text would come up. You could just read it. Um, I could copy it if I needed to. So it was just much, much more easier. Um, you know, at this point, uh, the instructor would post assignments in, in the syllabus and I could just at my leisure go through and find out what the assignments were. Um, the assignments were all posted online so I could just go to the website and have my screen reader um, read all that to me. Um, the, the really cool thing for me, uh, just in contrast, uh, you know, going to school, um, you know, uh, and on an actual, you know, physical, you know, campus, um, you know, people right away knew that I was blind and that kind of created, you know, some, some anxiety, um, some, some on my part, some on their part. Um, but the thing that, you know, I really enjoyed was, you know, being able to do my classes online, um, my assignments and my um, class discussion comments, you know, they look the same as everybody else's. And so from that point, I was really truly on an equal playing field. Um, I didn't have to do anything extra. Um, my research papers look the same as, you know, the next guy's. Um, and I really didn't have to disclose that I had a disability unless I wanted to. Um, uh, and so it was, it was a really good experience um, for me. And I, and I realize that everybody doesn't always take to the online um, world as well as, you know, maybe I do, but for me, it was a great experience. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing. And, you know, I think nowadays it's, it's even more the case, you know, especially after COVID people are more and more, you know, wanting to, to, because they feel more comfortable to do, do things virtually, but also I feel like it opened doors, you know, like, whereas before, um, you wouldn't dream of having a doctor's appointment virtually. And now it's like, oh yeah, no big deal. You know? And I feel like it makes, it has allowed people to think outside the box. Um, and so anyway, this was a long way to answer your question, but I think that it's super important because it's just going to, it's happening more and more and more. Um, and like Casey said, um, you know, it allows um, people to be on equal footing because, you know, you're, you could be in a class and nobody knows that um, you have a visual impairment um, or that you have any kind of disability, but for that to be successful, um, it has to be accessible. Um, and so like, there are going to be things that, um, would be tough, you know, like, I don't know, geometry, like, I mean, I'm just thinking, like, if I had to do a geometry class online, um, boy, that would, <laughs> that would be, that would be interesting. Um, but, you know, there is, I guess, we have more technology than, than we did 20 years ago, and, and that maybe could, could make it more, um, more accessible um, somehow. But, um, yeah, Ometa, what was your, did you have some ideas around that, around like online learning and making it more accessible and things like that? Yes, I, I think that it is important also. Um, I was doing some um, research about this. I was trying to, I built some sculptures that are accessible and they have braille. So people can take those sculptures in their hands and experiment see oh. how it works and it has a label so they know this is a pulley this is a ramp and they can try it themselves with their hand and people eh, who are excited that they can see they can also see physics in the real world and i was trying to make it like more interactive for everyone and it can also be broadcast online okay cool so i, I, That's I was trying do some experiments and thank you for sharing guys you guys with us in this um, experience because that makes give, give me more 
interest to keep uh, developing things online and both hybrid things for for inclusion and, and learning. Yeah, definitely. And um, thank you for wanting to to make things more accessible. I have a question real quick for uh, for for Casey and and, and Judy. Um, Regarding that the, that software and that hardware that you showed us that has that scrolling mechanism where it helps you um, read what's on on your screen, um, I was just thinking of like a side um, venture avenue. How how what's the cost an average cost of one of those, and and how realistic or how accessible is that to say like a middle school kid who maybe just doesn't have the means to pay for one of those and and what if we did, we created some type of fund and try to get like grants to get those out? Because that would, I think, would increase your, your accessibility to the internet and education as a whole in, in a, an impactful way. Absolutely. Um, and Case, I don't know if you wanna, if, if you have anything to, uh, to chime in. Um, as far as um, how expensive they are, they're really expensive. Um, I want to say that um, it's so. Remember how I was saying that, like um, some of them have, you know, 18, 20, 32 cells, 40 cells. I want to say, and um, I know this is being recorded and broadcast and all of that. So I'm hopefully not going to be quoted on this, uh, um, but it's. Um, I heard um, someone say that it was like $100 a cell. So like, imagine if you have, you know, um, you know, if it was a 10 cell one, which, you know, there's not. So that would be like $1,000, you know, $3,000 for like a 30, for 30 cells. And that's only for the Braille, the part that, you know, um, just the, 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 uh, the actual like Braille display, not like any of the, um, the rest of it. And of course, you know, not all the, this isn't like a hard and fast uh, rule. So um, there are braille displays that are, that are a little less expensive, but, but on the whole, they're, they're pretty up there. So, you know, having a way to either make some that are less expensive or creating some sort of a fund or, or grants and, you know, even thinking about other countries, like, um, because here I feel like there's more access in the education system um, to have some of these um, devices, um, you know, um, through um, the Department of Education and everything. But like, if you went to, I don't know, you know, another country, um, these, these, they would definitely not be, and especially not um, the latest and greatest, you know, they may have some of them, but they may not have enough for every child to have one or um, they may not. So yeah, anyway, the short answer is that yes, they're expensive and yes, it would be helpful um, to have um, to have them even either uh, be cheaper or have like a, some sort of a fund or grants or something to, to give more access to these, um, especially, you know, people on their own, like, you know, that don't have like an organization helping them behind them, like, um, you know, if they're not, um, you know, like, for example, um, you know, I work for the state of Colorado. If somebody um, is part of, um, if somebody is a client of the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation, um, they may, may have access to equipment like that um, if it's going to help them on their job. But um, if the person, you know, for whatever reason isn't, um, doesn't have access to, and not all like there's not always funding available everywhere for for someone to ha to have that um, that type of equipment. So perfect. Thank and, you so much. And I, I would just like to add too that um, you know part of part of what makes the braille display is so expensive right now is just the type of technology that is that is used. Um, so there's efforts on the uh, on the horizon to you know bring down the cost of that technology um you know freedom scientific has started doing that um you know in and um but there's other technologies coming out um you know with malleable plastics and different things like that um i'm not real up on 
you know, the research behind that, but there are other technologies. Some of them use like um, compressed air to push up um, like uh, yeah, plastic, you know, in a, in a small compressed way to bring up braille dots. And so there's different things out there that are, you know, being researched that if, if, if one of them comes out that it could drastically you know, reduce the cost of, of, of braille. So there's, there's some things going on there. Yeah, Omero, I think you've mentioned something about the air, about something like that. Um, I, I remember you saying something. Yes, they were doing some experiments with the compressor to reduce mm -hmm. the cost mechanism, but haven't worked yet. Mm. An experiment. Well, keep at it. <laughs> Judy, if there is something that you think that's important for young students, or students in general that are visually impaired, a, a, for example, some technology or something that is expensive or is not available for everyone. What should that we can build for them? What, what is it? Oh, wow. Um, you know, eh, if there was a way and I don't know, maybe there is, and Casey, maybe you know of something where like, you know, just thinking about, you know, mm, geometry class, for example, um, like, would there be something out there where somebody could just, you know, graph something or, um, you know, have, have like, um, you know, shapes or angles or, um, and that, you know, somebody, for it to be tactual for somebody without having to like create it with, you know, string on paper or something like that. Is there, um, do they have technology like that at all? Um, case that you know of that, that does. The closest something? thing probably right now would be something with 3D printing. Yeah, you could, you could 3D print something and do something mm -hmm. like that. Um, um, we probably won't get to spontaneous you know technology like that unless we get to um holograms that we can actually touch and actually feel and interact with that's coming but it's not here yet <laughs> okay um yeah i don't know i'm just thinking like um just making it whatever is going to make science you know the the math and science is more accessible um to kids with visual impairments um, you know, I, th I think is, uh, is important because, um, I think there are lots of, I, I think there's a lot of potential that maybe isn't being, um, you know, um, people, people maybe aren't pursuing these careers as much because they feel like it's not as accessible. Um, and there is, um, there, you know, there, there, there are, um, resources out there. Um, and groups that can, um, you know, help um, people, you know, blind kids and visually impaired kids get into um, math and science. But, um, you know, I think anything that makes um, that more reachable and accessible for, for kids, um, you know, I think that's always a plus. Thank you for answering. That's yeah. interesting. Thank you very much, Judy, for a great, uh, great talk tonight. Um, Thank you. To listen to you again. Um, so I don't know how many people we had on the, you know, uh, Homiro, do we have, like last time, do we have any question from the other audience? Yes, from, uh, from YouTube. Mm -hmm. Answer. Somebody asked if you had like, oh no, when did you, uh, there is um, Jose Rodriguez asked, when you start college, did you receive some induction program to help while studying in campus? I'm sorry, when I started college, did I receive, can you repeat the question? When you started college, did you receive some induction program to help you while studying in campus, like an induction program? Um, I don't think so. I don't remember. Um, on campus? 
studying on camp? Yeah, no, I don't know. Like for example, uh, for visually impaired resources. So there was an office of um, disability services at both colleges, or both universities that I went to had the office of disability services, um, which, you know, they were there to help me with like, you know, um, if I had to take tests, um, you know, I could go and take the test there or um, they helped me access um, equipment and stuff like that, um, or um, helping me access books and stuff. But um, yeah, so that I did have that. That was the, the question we had in, in YouTube. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. We have learned so much. And Cassie, we have learned so much from your experience and from your knowledge in this field. We feel very humbled and excited to keep working in this project because we think that uh, working together and with your help, we will achieve a great change and a positive change in our society to make it more inclusive and better overall. That's awesome. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share a little bit about my experience. And if, if there's ever um, anything that I can do to help um, or to um, test out anything or, um, you know, anything like that, you know, we're, we're happy to do that. And um, just thank you guys so much for, wanting to change the world and, you know, keep, keep moving forward. I know that you will, and you're already starting to. So, um, yeah, thanks for letting me be a part of, of that. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Judy, thank you, Cassie. Judy, I started part of the team. <laughs> thank you. Thanks guys. You're welcome. Have a good night, everyone. Have a good night. Good Happy night. holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy new year. Thank happy you. holiday, happy all these. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you bye bye. Bye. Bye.